Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the globe. Welcome to our launch event for our film series, Essentials for Daily Lives, Positive Stories for a Dynamic Industry. This series is a result of a unique collaboration between BBC Storyworks, Cosmetics Europe and partner companies and associations. It offers a behind the scenes look, uh, at a progressive, innovative, dynamic cosmetics and personal care industry. And in particular, what we're doing to uh, improve products, enhance people's lives and help support our planet. In this event, we're going to be talking a little bit about the background to the films. Uh, we're going to be talking about our industry, of course, a little bit about how we can help consumers and stakeholders understand it a little bit better and more broadly, how we can increase trust in our industry and perhaps industry generally and some of the more general themes associated with that. Now to help us with that we have two very distinguished guests. We have Simon Shelley, Director of Programme Partnerships at BBC Global News. Welcome Simon from London. Hello. And we have Gurpri Bra, General Manager of Edelman Brussels, joining us uh, here in Brussels. Hi everyone. So we want this to be an interactive session so if you have any questions please don't be shy. You can post your questions on the live stream and we'll pick them up as we go along. But let's start with a trailer. Billions of cosmetics are sold worldwide. Cosmetics are very important in our everyday life. People use them and they don't think about it. The consumer can be sure we take care of the people that are involved in our supply chain. Nothing we have done would have been done if it was not for the people. I help them to have a better skin, and if they have better skin, they can have a better life. I'm proud to continue my mother's story, not only with the products, but by empowering women to follow their dreams. Consumers are very keen on getting personalized services, experience or products. My aim is to create safe products for everyday use. It's important that those products have quality and performance. The products that I see every day, it's as natural as you get and it's renewable. People want to help save the world as much as they can. We have the amazing opportunity to shift the world in the right direction. We recognize that we have a responsibility to lead the industry to achieve a greater level of sustainability. To achieve true change is not going to be one company or one government. It's going to take all of us working together. It's key to have a healthy planet in order to survive, in order to have a future. There really is an amazing power to bring together nature with science. Taking care of the people, taking care of biodiversity for the benefit of human beings. People, planet, products. Because we personally care. Let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the background to the series and perhaps why you chose to focus on cosmetics? Yeah, sure. Well, hello, everybody out there. Um, yeah, well, firstly, to explain BBC Global News in the context of the BBC, the best way to think about it is everything outside the UK. So all the dot com sites, feature sites, news sites, world news. Um, we have 465 million viewers uh, around the world, BBC. Uh, 146 million of those are, are monthly browsers online. And that's important because we can track their interests, their behaviours, ultimately serve them the, the type of thing that they want to see. And, and that, that data was crucial in informing our decision to make a, a series on, uh, on cosmetics and personal care. BBC Storyworks, that's the creative uh, division within BBC Global News. And it's important that, that the, the content came out of that division because this is not news reports. We wanted to make cinematic mini documentaries to really grip and grab people to inform them. And, and, there, and go right back, um, a lot of what the BBC does, a lot of the content it creates is very snackable. We tend to talk in headlines and we had a desire to, to make content about, more in-depth content about the issues that shape society. 
um, people clearly have a thirst for knowledge on those subjects. And cosmetics and personal care is, is certainly one of those issues. What led us to that is it, it, firstly, it was about wellness. It was indexing very highly on the BBC. And we realized yeah. that the particular yeah. problem yeah. What do you mean by indexing highly on the BBC? What's that, sorry? What do you mean by indexing highly on the BBC? So we, we get to track the interests and behaviors of, of browsers on BBC sites. And we can look at the number of, of articles that they're reading on particular subject matter. And we can start to infer insights as, as to what topics are really interesting them. And wellness was a topic, not just uh, in terms of, of health, but the impact of products on uh, mental health and self-esteem. This started our interest in personal care and cosmetics. Of course, we started to learn about the economic contribution the sector makes, not just in European society, but, but globally. And then we started to look at the brands, the leading brands in the sector that, that of course, a lot of consumers are looking towards to be the leaders on issues such as sustainability and responsible practices. Um, and, and we realized that all of this was occurring in this uh, complex, but dynamic and innovative and influential sector, um, but one where the average person might only consider it as selling makeup. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me stop you there were you that average person before you started the series uh, yes. tell us a little bit about your your learning experience um uh, what we've learned from making the series yeah a little bit because were you one of those average person who equates cosmetics with makeup we'll come back to that issue in the discussion but uh, tell, tell us what your personal experience was i couldn't what possibly was tell you whether i was one of those those people <laughs> but <laughs> um we we well, we've, we've had the privilege of working with uh, brands to, to tell important stories. And I think there's one learning that we've made. We, we, we've seen generally brands shift from a, a focus on product to people in, in their stories. And I think I mentioned earlier this idea of, of self-esteem and, and mental health and products, the impact that, that can have. And so when we started out, we thought, well, if we can get uh, consumers people using the products and really show their story and get that passion and emotion across on screen, that, that will become gripping. What we've learned and what we found is that actually the innovation, the dynamism from the sector is, is often, is obviously comes from somewhere and it comes from the people within the companies. Great ideas don't just materialize, they, they come from the, the human mind and focusing on the people at those companies um, whether it be the scientists or the founders, uh, really their story has been as, as gripping, as compelling and as compelling as anything else. Um, and so perhaps we didn't appreciate that, but what we've learned is that that could be a focus. So excellent. So we have one theme in the whole series, which is people, and we talk about some of the issues that you refer to there, self-esteem and, uh, and so forth. Tell us one or two things about the challenges about making this series because it's extraordinary global sweep. You go from Haiti to New York to Nigeria to Tokyo to Europe. Tell us a little bit about the challenges that you face when you made the series. It was truly global. You're absolutely right. Um, we were, were filming in all sorts of different uh, places. Uh, we were working with such a variety of different uh, people. Um, I think I think one of the challenges actually was to make sure that we did uh, through all of that, the starting point was a discussion about um, uh, about the impact that cosmetics and, and personal care products have on people. They're essential in their daily lives, and the impact it has on their daily lives. And, and, and sticking with that theme, and and trying to tell a story that's, that's focused um, on on that impact, and not necessarily just reverting back to the product and what it does. And 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 I, and. I hope that we've we've managed to do that. It was I think it was a real pleasure working with the companies involved because they really went along with that. Yeah, that, I mean it's interesting you you say that because of course your your comments about the index show that cosmetics and personal care is interesting for people. They like to read about it. Sometimes they're reading about what products do. Sometimes the press is a little bit challenging and tends to be a little bit negative. One of the features of our series is that we're trying to stress some of the positive aspects of the industry, some of the aspects of the industry that people are not always so familiar with. And you, you have some thoughts about what you call solutions-based journalism as perhaps an antidote to some of the more negative type 
coverage that we tend to see from time to time, sometimes in our sector too. Tell us about that. Yeah, so solutions focused journalism is something that BBC journalists across the organisation use. What we've uh, tried to do in BBC Storyworks is take the notion of the way that those stories are framed and use it with the stories that we, we tell uh, from brands. And, and the essence of it, of course, is that um, you should be able to tell positive, constructive, solutions based. Uh, stories. Not every single story or news article has to be about something that's broken or isn't right. However, if you don't get the framing of that story correct, then uh, that positive story might end up being a bit of a puff piece or a PR exercise or, or, or dare I say it, woke washing. And I know. So look, we, we, we've got a, a bit of a structure, and of course, it, you know, it's identifying the problem and, and being clear on what that problem is, not too broad, but why, what are the consequences of not fixing that problem, looking at solutions and, and not being simplistic about those solutions, the, the how, getting into the mechanics of, 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 a, of, of, a, of a solution. So how do natural ingredients come, come through that process? How do we recycle plastic waste? Um, evidence, of course, is, is important in this type of storytelling, but there's two fundamental parts to this approach, um, which must be in there. One is about limitations. Um, and this is uh, really encouraging brands to be open and transparent about the challenges. Um, uh, you know, these things don't happen overnight. The idea of refillable products, you know, it's about changing habits as much as anything else. It will take time. Um, likewise with plastic waste, it, it's okay not to have all the answers. And, and that's absolutely fine. As long as you've got a plan and you've, you've got the right mindset, um, that, that kind of honesty can play a key role in building trust. And then the final point, really a, a question that you have to ask in this approach is about scalability. If this is a solution that can work, can it be scaled up? What we're looking to avoid is just short-term projects that might have just come out of the marketing department. Can it be in a holistic approach from the business? Can it be up, scale, up and down the supply chain? Can it be scaled to the point where the environment is benefiting, where people are really benefiting in a, in a substantial way? And if you put all this together, hopefully you, you get a more believable piece. Well, you mentioned the word trust. That's a perfect moment to bring in Gerbrick, working for Edelman. Edelman is well known across the world for its trust barometer. Gerbrick, perhaps you could comment a little bit about that and perhaps more generally on the issue of trust and the and the challenges that businesses and perhaps our industry in particular faces in building trust. Yeah, no, so firstly, uh, just to commend the work that has been done on both sides by StoryWorks and then also by Cosmetics Europe as well, just to bring these stories to life because I think these are such important stories that need to be told. There are, there's no such thing as a easy solution to a very big diverse problem. So complex solutions for complex problems uh, and we need to tell the stories around those. Uh, as you outlined, I work at Edelman and I'm very proud to uh, wear my Edelman blue on my collar whenever I, when I, whenever I trot out. But the, we've been looking at the issue of trust for nearly 20 years now and it really started in the US around the year 2000 when we wanted to look at trust between government and NGOs and now we've really scaled that up to look year on year across the globe at what's happening to the, to the currency of trust and we kind of look at a whole raft of different areas but the main thing that we want to try and focus in on is to build trust there's two constituent elements firstly the ethics that any company or any industry needs to really draw down on and nearly 76 percent of all trust is based on the ethical part of the conversation and then the competence uh, and 24 percent of trust builds out into the competence uh, and that then breaks down into subcategories as well ability dependability purpose but they're the two key constituent elements to drive trust. And I think it's really important for everyone just to remember that. We've been doing study after study for many years, as I alluded to, in looking at trust in government, looking at trust in NGOs, business, and then the media as well. And we've seen up until the point of COVID, actually trust in all aspects of our society seemed to be diminishing, which was actually not very heartening and very saddening for us to see. Uh, and then, of course, along comes COVID and things uh, start to change very, very quickly. We did three 
emergency reports um, kind of during the period of COVID, wanting to have a look at what actually is happening to the state of trust. And what we saw was there was a trust reemergence across all different parts of the various different entities that we look at. So government, NGOs, business, and the media were all seeing a bounce in trust. Um, we kind of turned that as a, is this a trust bubble? So we left a question mark around it. So is this a long lasting trend or is this just a bubble? Uh, but one of the starkest things that we saw was specifically around governments, we were seeing that the government was now entrusted to deal with all of the challenges around the pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, everything from containing the pandemic to informing the public, to helping and shaping the responses, it was now government who was being trusted. And just to kind of say that during the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, we saw something very similar, where the public turned very quickly to entrust the government with with the trust to, to rebuild where they deemed that was necessary. In the last couple of weeks, unfortunately, our data started to show that trust has started to, to spread out in different directions, moving away from government. And I think a number of different things have happened as a result of that. One is obviously, we're starting to see some governments necessarily not stepping up to the challenge. So the expectations that were placed on them by populations, that some people don't feel that they're living up to those expectations. We're seeing the same in some quarters of the media, social media, once seen as a broad driver of uh, honest communication during the height of the pandemic, now not necessarily holding the same sway. And so trust is starting to, to burst in some areas and, and we're still tracking that, but we can come back. Your specific question is what is happening to trust in brands, particularly in this industry? And I think two different things need to be brought in together. One, obviously COVID and the second, we're seeing a lot of expectations being placed on brands as a result of the the, the, the broader race conversation we're now starting to have as well. And, and I think the two of them are redefining the landscape on what we expect from our industries and redefining the expectations of what we expect from brands as well. So the two things merge together. We are seeing that there is now a huge amount of responsibility being placed on brands to say, first and foremost, stand up and say what you are trying to say to help solve, not sell. Uh, so don't just try and sell us things, try and demonstrate that you are solving some of these critical problems. And then when you try to do that, do it in a genuine manner. Don't do it in a haphazard, actually, we're going to put a statement out to demonstrate that we're aligned with some of these big debates. Do it because you are genuinely part of these conversations and then demonstrate where you move. And those apply equally to the cosmetic sector as they do to any other sector as well. So uh, the debate around trust has been transformed as we've moved into 2020. And so a lot of our research now is focusing in on helping our clients and our brands really understand where they need to take these conversations. Okay, we're going to come back to a number of those themes there with your very rich comments. But now uh, it's time for a, for a Let's see a trailer now. Still on mute. Thank you very much. That was a trailer for the the people theme, and uh, you raised the issue of people as well, Simon, in your in your comments. One of the issues that we have as as the as the cosmetics industry is that um, not only is the range of what is a cosmetic sometimes misconstrued, as I said in my comments to you earlier, Simon, people tend to think cosmetics are decorative uh, cosmetics, but also. They sort of think cosmetics are, are sort of dispensable, superficial, not really necessary and nice to have, but don't really make any contribution to people's lives. Now, Simon, you made your comments earlier when you introduced this series that this is a sort of learning that you've had. How do you think that the industry should address this perception that cosmetics don't really matter that much to people? Because we know from the series on people that it's, it's not true. 
yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's obvious, I suppose very obvious to say that this comes from storytelling um, and depicting stories that aren't just about the, the products, but stories about the organizations. I mentioned before, it feels as though there's this shift from a focus on the products themselves to the, the people benefiting from it. Well, maybe there's a shift to the people behind those products, and maybe there's a shift to talking more about the companies themselves and the journey that, that they've been on. Um, I suppose that what was, what was exciting about this series is it would give us the space and time to go more in depth to look at those processes, to go right back to understanding where natural ingredients com are, are coming from, to, to work through those th those stories, um, and and I think it, within that kind of of storytelling, as, as I mentioned, I, I think it's that kind of open and honesty about the uh, about the company and the things that they're trying to do differently, um, and I and I and I, I think again, it's 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 really focusing on rhetoric turning into action i think just some of the comments that that Gopri was talking about uh, just before and 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 certainly in the last couple of, of weeks about uh, race relations is 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 not having passive empathy for issues in society society whether that be sustainability or, or responsible practices but but showing the action that's going on uh, at companies and brands and our learning is that there's so much going on so really there should be uh there should be a desire to tell those stories bring more understanding and with that understanding a change in perceptions might happen good you mentioned the, the covid crisis and obviously that's a, a huge global tragedy but in a sense it slightly changed the perception of the industry not simply because a lot of our companies manufactured hand sanitizer and so forth and changed their production lines but not everybody associated the cosmetics industry with fairly basic products like hand gels for example not particularly glamorous but extraordinarily extraordinarily effective so this i think goes back to your point about genuineness genuineness and perhaps also talks such as simon's point about stories how do you think that we bring out that more yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I just wanted to start by saying that the, the stories of using um, cosmetics don't start and end in the last 10 years. We, we can go back all, all the way back in human history and we will find many different uh, uses of cosmetics that have, have actually littered human history in a very, very positive way. You know, when we look at the expression of the geisha in Japan or the, the, the expression of the Mujara dance form in India, um, you know, we see that cosmetics were used for a whole raft of different reasons uh, and these debates are nothing new so uh, um, but talking on the point and building on the point that you just mentioned around covid i actually think it's it's positive that we're seeing the realistic uh, um, story around products being told not only in the form of hygiene but also you know there are skin products that are essential to protect us against the sun there are products that some of us actually have to use on a day-to-day -day basis for our hair to, to actually look after our hair and make sure it's 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 in a good place but then there's also a broader discussion around you know mental health mental well-being and then the true expression of self and and i find those stories to be very exciting i'm, I'm addicted to the tv program rupaul's drag race I actually think it's a beautiful way to bring out the true stories of people uh, on our screens on a day-to-day -day basis. You can see, you know, drag queens who express themselves 100%. That, that's a beautiful story to be told. I don't think we should diminish that just because it doesn't align with our worldview. But I do think there's a broader story that we need to be telling about the essential need of cosmetics. And we need to be powering that story consistently and constantly because any person on this call or anywhere else probably uses cosmetics but do we then at the same time diminish the, their relevance when we're on social media if so we should question that and it comes back to the point that we were talking about earlier that there are no such thing as simple solutions to some of these problems we may not like some products uh, and that's fair um, we may have our own personal opinions about that and maybe when we talk about products i'll express my personal opinions on some aspects of those products but that doesn't mean that we get to diminish the entire category. And, and that's where I think we need to have a more robust conversation. Yeah, let's let's pick up on that point, because Simon, you, you very correctly say that stories are a very, very useful way to illuminate brands and promote some sort of an emotional attachment uh, to brands. Um, but how do we do that for, for an industry as a whole? I mean, the industry is 
more than in some of its parts in that respect. And I think if you talk to people within the cosmetics and personal care industry, they'll say that, okay, well, certain brands do a very good job of telling stories, but there is an overall perception of our industry, which we need to build on and tell stories about, which might lead to these improvements of understanding and comprehension, which I think we would value and consumers would value because they would understand our industry a little bit better. Yeah. So how do we move from brands to an industry? Well, I, I mean, storytelling has been around forever. I mean, we were telling stories to each other when we were cavemen and women. Um, and and to, to, you know, it, we tell stories because it takes people on an emotional journey. And when you feel emotions, when you're watching something, your brain is hardwired to link those feelings to the information you're being given. So actually, by telling each other stories, we're, we're telling each other things that become more memorable. Uh, and that's really that's really vital. And of course, for, for many, many, many years, uh, marketing's been around about stories, the stories you tell, not the products you sell. But what has to happen is, is, is a focus on the story. What can often uh, occur is that when it comes to the execution of uh, a piece of content, or, or, a, or a piece of, of marketing, all of a sudden exceptional consideration might be given to the brand message or the overall message. What we've got as time has gone on is this democratization of, of, of media, so social media and, and, and everything else and YouTube when it started in what was it, 2004 or five, it, you, 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 anyone at the moment can pick up their phone and they can broadcast something to millions of people. So, so you've got brands and you've got a sector as a whole that can, can incessantly be putting messages out there. But just to focus on the message is the issue. We've got to go right back and just be happy to tell stories about about the industry and not focus too much on, on on ramming those messages home but just tell great stories uh, about the ideas that are coming from innovative dynamic people in the sector and and we often say actually um we've seen this trend at um at bbc storyworks we call it brands as broadcasters and and the sense behind that is that that broadcasters the likes of a bbc or a netflix they've got one thing in mind and that's that's viewers they are keep trying to keep people glued to the screen. And so if you start from a place where you consider people as viewers and not customers or stakeholders, then that's the starting point to start engaging people. And if you engage people and you connect with them emotionally, in other words, if you get them to like you first, then it will be easy to shift the dial on understanding and perception. Gerpri, you're nodding vigorously, comment. Yeah, no, I just wanted to jump in to say that actually, the specific question about how do you do it on a sector wide level, actually, I think this series is, 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 a, is a prime example of how you do it on a sector wide level. I think you take it to, up to a thematic level, you know, so you can have stories around people, you can definitely have stories around planet, and you can have uh, stories around product. And that allows you to then really not necessarily speak about any one brand, but it allows you to uncover the stories that sit underneath. And, and you know, you, from an issues perspective, you could rally that up into different ways. Sustainability could be an issue or climate could be the one that you start, start to slant towards. But thematic approaches increasingly, just as we do on a pan-European level, that seems to be the way forward as, as far as I think of it, where an industry or an association can get alignment from brands and, and those that it works with on, the, on that basis. Yeah, and actually, sorry, I, just, I have to jump in there. And you're, 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 you're so right, Gopri. And, and, and what we, another thing that we learned from, from doing this is it's just how well all of the brands who are effectively competitors are, are working together cohesively for, for the, those, those common goals and how important it is to have a body like Cosmetics Europe really leading the, the way on that. And another thing to, that, that sprung to mind, actually, as you, you're speaking, when we were going through this in terms of the, the angles of, of really what's going to grip people, I suppose it was that idea of imagining a world without cosmetics and personal care. Imagine the sector as a whole didn't exist. You know, what, what would life be like? Yes, this is often something we point out when we try and explain to the people that cosmetics are toothpaste and oral care and soap, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm interested in your point about associations. Naturally, I'm Director General of Cosmetics Health and Association. How do you think associations, and this is one for you, do Gerbery, can be agents for this kind of reputational and trust exercise? 
Apart yeah, so, from the operations with the BBC, of course. Of course, of course. Look, I, I think I think um, the obvious answer to this is that uh, I do. I'm going to start off by saying something slightly controversial, which when I hear people say, um, you know, we're not we're not respected or regarded well enough, or people don't like us, my immediate reaction is, is well, actually. What are you doing to try and balance out the narrative and balance out the discussion around you? So don't be a passive victim is always my starting point. Be an active participant is where everyone should be thinking to be. As we kind of then ladder that up, of course, individual categories have a role and responsibility to be, be part of that conversation. Brands have a responsibility to be part of that conversation. And without doubt, industry associations need to be part of that conversation as well. I do think it is challenging uh, in today's day and world being an industry association, particularly as we were talking about the politicization of brands. Brands are going to increasingly be pulled in multiple different directions. You know, we, we can go back to what I call the three different periods of, uh, of uh, the brand uh, politicization, you know, the 2000s where you know, aligning yourself with the STGs, nice to have, not necessarily important, but if you do it, wow, what an interesting piece of work you're doing. You then kind of fast forward to the 2010s uh, and you start to see increasingly brands pulled into conversations by accident, actually. A lot of the times it wasn't deliberate. They were being pulled into conversations about LGBTQI issues or around race, but not feeling very comfortable pulled into those. Some brands obviously have had a consistent relationship with all three of these categories uh, and then move into the 2020 period. Now expectation on all brands is be part of the conversation. And, and we have seen that. So those that have been quite happy to sit by and watch while others have taken a stance or not taken a stance, now we're all being part of that. I think it makes the role of the trade association extreme, extremely complex because previously we were negotiating and discussing things based on the kind of the areas which were presented to us now we're going to have to increasingly have a proactive view on things that aren't necessarily on the horizon but could quite quickly come down the horizon so i don't envy the job that you've got is what i'm saying in, in a nutshell but i do think with that is an exciting opportunity because those trade associations that are able to push their members in a particular direction to see where that direction needs to head I think we'll actually end up being much more empowered and entrusted as we go forward. Yes, indeed. You have to be part of the conversation. And that's something that we've learned even in, over the last two weeks, I think, for those of you who have been watching the news. That's so right. OK, it's time for another trailer on the theme of planet. Just a reminder to everybody that those are not the actual films. That's just a trailer. We do have films on all sorts on that particular on that particular theme of sustainability and planet related related issues, water refillables, sustainability, uh, di biodiversity, sustainable sourcing, and so forth. Gurpri, do you think sustainability is a special case of uh, trust building in this day and age? Um. So again, it kind of, you know, I think we've, it, there's a 2019 and a 2020 POV around the debate around sustainability. 2019, I think we were all signed, sealed and delivered around the need to act. Um, the European Commission, the new European Commission, who I think have uh, done a lot of fantastic work in this space, uh, announced very early on in the year their ambitious Green Deal, which again is moving us in the right direction as far as I'm concerned. As, uh, as, a, as, an in, as a global debate and conversation needs to be. Uh, but as soon as the pandemic uh, arrived, we kind of started to have a lot of commentary around whether the time was now for sustainability to be taken off the agenda and, uh, and maybe we could walk away from it. There's a great piece on Politico 
today, uh, which was research commissioned by YouGov that looks at actually where is public sentiment around uh, this particular issue and public sentiment on the big topics around uh, the, the green agenda are still very much where they were in 2019, particularly in Europe. So I, I think the clear message that I want to send, if anyone's willing to listen, is, you know, this is not a 2019 conversation. It is very much a 2020s conversation as well. And every indication that we've seen from the European institutions is, is that they will be the global uh, policer of this particular uh, area of, of work. And so, you know, the Green Deal is very much there and it's very much part of the future. On the point around sustainability, the question then comes down to whose responsibility is it, you know, and, and we've been having, some brands have been having a very, very sophisticated debate for many, many years that predates policy, um, but others have been lagging behind. And, and I would say that the writing for a lot of us is actually on, on the wall. We, we, we know that the expectations are there. We know that uh, trust is enhanced when we're moving on the certain conversations. So it does make a lot of sense regardless of the pandemic to still continue investing and thinking about how we create a sustainable future uh, and particularly in Europe I think that's a really positive and heartening conversation that we're having. You, you talked in your in your early statements about competence and, and ethical behaviour and one of the issues around the debate is particularly in the light of the economic challenges presented during the Covid processes is this the time to be pushing forward uh, a fairly aggressive green agenda which is necessarily going to impose costs on people and you know let's face it people are a little bit worried about the economic consequences of moving towards a greener type of economy how do we reconcile this sort of competence aspect or the reconcile to keep the need to keep the economy doing well and companies making profits with the broader ethical objectives and the broader ethical concept if i put that in a nutshell is there a contradiction between profit and purpose if i can put it that way yeah well uh, and i'm i'm sure some of the people on the the call will feel that within their individual brands they have done a lot of work to to determine that actually there isn't a contradiction between profits and purpose you know i'm not going to call out any specific brand but everyone knows who, who they are and so some brands have already spent the last 15 years uh, kind of preempting this conversation and this debate uh, and and we should all take our hats off to them um the, the bigger question is for those brands that haven't necessarily had the ability to do that over the course of the last 15 years from the starting position where we're in today and the vast amount of expectations that are going to be placed on all of us in the next 12 months is it fair to then equally put the burden of responsibility on those brands as well as we move into the next 12 months and, and i would say well, actually, we're seeing a lot of direct uh, noise coming from institutions and governments to say that there will be support in places where support needs to be provided. And, and that's where we, I think there's the combination of the partnership approach, which will become um, even more fundamental than it ever has been. You know, there's always been this kind of unhappy slash uneasy partnership between the public sector and the private sector. I feel the 2020s actually will find the two are natural bedfellows more so than they ever envisaged and they will probably end up doing more collaborative work as we're seeing with the healthcare industry and, and governments around uh, vaccine we're probably going to see that type of partnership become increasingly the norm and, and the green deal slash sustainability i expect to be enhanced in that particular way do you believe business should be partnering more with organizations which have been traditionally I can uh, can say this a little bit antagonistic towards industry and business and and vice versa. I personally believe conversation brings people together. I've you know we can we're going to come back. I'm happy to come back and talk about race at any time. I've been active on the issue of race for many years. I've probably been called living in Brussels, everything under the sun. Um, you know, uh, from all the worst things that you can possibly imagine. I am also a very proud gay man. I married to my husband. But I've never once thought that actually the difference allows me to be uh, awkward or difficult. We have to speak to one another and it doesn't matter how complex those conversations may be unless we get into a room and discuss. We do actually by accident drive the populist agenda, you know, so we help support the things that we all sit around and say that we don't uh, like in our society if we 
pull up the drawbridge and say, I'm only going to speak about X, Y, and Z. That, that, that doesn't work for me. So I've always taken that approach as an individual, but I expect brands, associations, institutions to be increasingly taking that approach as well. And, and a lot of them have. I don't want to uh, make this sound like a lot of brands haven't. A lot of brands are doing fantastic work where they're increasingly bringing multiple different stakeholders around the table to deal with some of those complex problems uh, that we need to have solutions for so we, we should we should champion those but everyone else should join the bandwagon they shouldn't sit over there and pretend that they can get on doing what they're doing i profoundly agree with you so anybody out there who's watching this series please come back and have a conversation with cosmetic Europe because we would like to think this series is part of an ongoing conversation but perhaps the uh, perhaps the part of a process of initiating dialogue with people or organizations we haven't always engaged with to achieve common art goals in the ethical space, be that in the area of environment, be that in the area of animal testing, you name it. Simon, yeah. profits and purposes. You were nodding vigorously before. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, I, I think um, profit and purpose is a fascinating conversation. We've probably spent an hour on that. And I think it is always the elephant in the room when it comes to discussions about uh, companies and how they're, they're, they're projects that they're putting in place with sustainability or, or responsible practices um it's got to be good for business if it, it, it's not good for business then back to that scalability point it will be a short-term csr project perhaps from the, the marketing department and, and and not the holistic view it won't really fly as a long-term uh change or evolution for for the business if it if it's not um profitable or or, or going to be good for business and I think the mindset is shifting to saying that profit and purpose absolutely can live together and should live together, whether that's driven by consumers who are making their decisions based on how, how companies uh, are behaving or, or simply uh, finding those complex solutions. They are complex to what is complex problems because sustainability is a very broad word and there's, there's, a, there's, there's lots of nuances in that but they absolutely can and, and should live together. And, and hopefully we've seen some of that on, on the series. Okay, now I can I, I, I take very much to heart your, your comments about scalability and holistic approaches, but some cynical people are gonna look at this series and say, well, this is, uh, we used the term before, woke washing or green washing. This is the industry trying to show an aspect to itself which is only skin deep it's there for show it's there to put relatively superficial messages and it doesn't indicate to the world anything meaningful about the industry's commitment to ethical behavior now you gentlemen you've seen the films i put it on the table do you think we're greenwashing and work washing or any other kind of washing <laughs> no. i i think the, there's ways to avoid uh woke washing and, and certainly in, in the structure of the storytelling that we talked about before uh is important so the idea of not just being impassive in your empathy for these issues but actually having a plan and action and showing being open about the limitations of that and, and how that might work long term i think that openness is 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 important because i think that vulnerability and showing a bit of vulnerability can can be a great way of of building trust but i i also think um it's really not us that that should decide it's 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 the it's going out there to audiences um, i mentioned before about the democratization of 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 uh, media and, and particularly social media and the opportunity for brands to speak to uh, a mass audience so easily and and and, and so regularly well actually what comes with that is uh, that accountability. If, if you're not, if you're, if it really is woke washing and the plan isn't really a long term plan, it doesn't quite make sense. I, I think you'll be found out and pulled up on that pretty quickly. Um, and I think that maybe perhaps that's happened in, in, in the last few weeks and the last few months. Okay, just before I go back to Gerber, I must remind everybody that you can ask questions. Uh, feel free to enter, enter, question, uh, enter questions onto the question, on the question function on the software. Gerpreet, how important is accountability in this, in this space? 
So, so extremely uh, important. I, I just very briefly just wanted to say that the you know I think uh, making uh, documentaries or making things by yourself and then pushing them out there without them being verified or being uh, checked uh, by someone else external who's credible uh, can at times be woke washing. But you're not necessarily. This is a uh, you know you're working with a very well recognised global entity, the BBC. Um, that they are the ones that are responsible and have pulled together these stories. And I think there is a certain degree of credibility that comes with that. And so you know it's therefore the responsibility of those that are that are putting the stories together to ensure that they are balanced and that they are trying to tell the story in the best way possible. So from a pure communications perspective, I think the approach is the right one. You put the content to, you entrust the content to someone very responsible with that content and then you let them tell the narrative and tell the story. And I watched the stories, I think they come out in a very, very balanced way. So no, I don't think that this is book washing. On your point around accountability, we are all able to hold you to account, right? That That's the world that increased democratization through social media means I can hold you to account through Twitter in 10 seconds or on LinkedIn or whatever other platform I choose to do so. And that will happen. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should stop putting out their good fact-based content. And, and that's my concern is sometimes I have heard in my own consultancy work, people saying, well, this will just get shot down, so we shouldn't do it. That that's not the right attitude. The right attitude has to be, if there is a debate out there, let's be active participants in that debate. Let's make sure our POV is also understood because that makes us all richer. We all learn as a, as a result of that process. It can't be the case that one loud voice gets to dominate just because it's loud. That That's not a good debate. That That's just loud. So that's uh, the point that I wanted to stress. Yeah, and, um, can I, can I just uh, jump in there because, sorry, John, we've got someone no, no. reminded me that uh, at the BBC, BBC Global News, uh, whilst it's not the journalist function, we yes, everything has to be substantiated and fact-checked, thanks for that. But there is another um, layer of, that, that we always have to go through um, at BBC Global News and, and StoryWorks, which is, is this the content we're making of value uh, to the viewer? And if it's not a value to the viewer, we will push back and say we, we need to change it. And it goes right back to, I suppose, what I, 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 we were talking about before, which is we have to put the viewer first. And, and if you're doing that with all of your storytelling, you'll you're start to, to, to create, create content in a way that, that won't seem as though it's, it's woke washing. Uh, put the viewer first, have stories as the focus. Okay, we have some questions coming in. I'll just pause to, to ask one question. Could you raise this a little bit uh, earlier in your remarks, uh, Gertrude, about changes post COVID in how we communicate to the world? What do you think the impact of COVID is on this general issue we're talking about in terms of communication, et cetera? This is a question from one of the, the viewers. Yeah, so I think there's two different things, actually. I think. Uh, first and potentially, you know, three weeks ago, it would have been just purely COVID. But I think now the global conversation we're having on race is actually also having an impact. And 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 I, and I think you know a couple of different things. And our global CEO Richard Edelman, who is a powerhouse when it comes to driving uh, um, conversations around these type of topics, uh, said a couple of weeks back. He said last week, sorry, that you know. We, we need to be really active about making public statements and commitments. So, of course, we want, uh, um, or whether that's on the race issue now, uh, yes, we should be having thought or communication out there. Second, we do then need to think about what are the things that we can do to try and enhance either the, the, the solutions around COVID or whether it is the, the policies and processes we can put in place around diversity and inclusion and, you know, having equal representation of races in our marketing material. I feel very passionately about, I grew up in Birmingham in, in the United Kingdom, have lived in a lot of places across Europe, but I do feel very passionately that we're losing not enough people that look like me are ever on my TV screen. That That's not good enough. And we Sorry. And then there was one final point, which I, I just, and this is, you know, I saw the piece around the BBC um, taking down certain 
products. And you know, we were very, we were all very right. Uh, we were very quick to take down certain programs like Little Britain around blackface. But is it in this day and age? Is it really okay for us to have products that allow us to whiteface? So you know. I have questions around the whole white face debate and we're seeing that debate now come to the surface. Very, very big debate and conversation around this and I think that's the right debate for them to be having. So Gurpreet, we, 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 you had a little bit of a, a weak connection there. We lost some of that, but I think we got the, the general point. So that's much appreciated. Okay, it's time to go to the final themed edit, which is on the theme of product. We lost Gurpreet. I hope that he will uh, come back in a little while. I see he's, ah, oh, there you are. You're back with us, Gurpreet. I hope you saw the trailer. One of the issues that we have in our in our products theme is, is science and, and safety. And there's, and there's a very nice film made by our German association about how we test for the safety of cosmetics products. And for us, as an industry, science is fundamentally important because we are a science-based industry in terms of developing innovation and we're a science-based industry in terms of making sure our products are safe. There is a feeling that uh, in the age of Twitter and social media and social media bubbles, etc., the scientific narrative has lost a little bit of force and it's more difficult for an industry like ours to defend our products on scientific grounds. And if you look again, going back to the COVID theme, it seems that millions of people think that Bill Gates is trying to inject people with microchips instead of giving them vaccines and so forth and so forth. Has it become harder to talk about science in the public sphere? And if so, how big a challenge is that for a science-based industry like ours? That's a big question. Simon. That is a very big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, probably at the heart of that, it's it's about where you can find a trusted voice, um, and and looking for 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 that trusted source of information. Um, perhaps that trusted source of information can't be found on or, on social media. Um, I, I remember um, there was a survey a number of years ago, and it was uh, uh, it was about millennials and how they consume news. And uh, sixty percent of of millennials said that they get their news from Facebook. But Facebook doesn't do news uh, in the strictest sense. So you, you, you can see where there's, there's, there's a breakdown there. And I think probably going back to uh, the point earlier, where is that trusted source of information? Well, I suppose that enhances the need for uh, membership bodies, uh, associations to be, to step forward and, and, and be that voice. Um, and, and I say step forward, I, I suppose they've always been that voice, but it, it's, 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 I suppose, a mechanism to have their voice heard over, over uh, potentially noise elsewhere. Um, so I, I, I think it's where that sort of information comes from and, and people being educated on where to, to get their, their information from. Gopri, what do you think? Yeah, hopefully my internet connection is stable again. But I think there's two different things here. One is content and the production of content and then the other is how do you actually put it out there and and what's the channel strategy look like around that and one thing that i'm always surprised by that we always make the assumption or actually we give the assumption that science-based content is boring and dry and fact-based and 
no one can really engage with it. Actually, I think you can do all of that. Uh, you know, you can have the hard numbers and the facts and not necessarily the, the exciting stuff, but then you can bake it in very, very engaging manners that you get it out through channels and, you know, GIFs and a whole raft of different digital tools nowadays that you can very easily accelerate around. So I, I think there's sometimes this mismatch between boring stories have to be told in boring ways. And, and I don't agree with that premise, point number one. And then point number two, I would say is our data has actually shown that, if anything, COVID has uh, brought back the, the kind of data-driven approach in kind of a strong way. You know, people nowadays are consuming a lot of information which are number specific, um, which hasn't been the case for many, many years. We've, we kind of went down a, a rabbit hole of, we were all content producers, so we, the shorter, the smaller, the better. Increasingly, I think we want to have more content but actually more detail-based content. And so I think that trend will last in the next couple of years that we're probably not gonna have just snippy little two, three second videos, but actually people wanting to absorb a little bit more and learn a little bit more. And around COVID, we have seen that accelerated. People don't just wanna understand what's happening in their own marketplace. They wanna understand what's happening in other marketplaces, what's happening in the broad conversations around vaccines. And so there's a lot more depth behind some of the conversations we're willing to have. Whereas before we were bouncing a lot between the information we were indigesting. Okay, we're, we're coming to the end now. I see a question from the audience. We, we picked planet people products as themes. Are there any areas where you think we should give attention as an industry for any future activities in this area or even any future film series? Very briefly, if you can, because we're in the last two minutes. Simon. Uh, sorry, you mean uh, further themes that we could explore? Yeah, one of the questions from the audience was, are there any themes that we should build on as an industry going forward, do you think? Well, I, I mean, I, again, I come back to, to the thing that we um, probably didn't appreciate as, as much at the outset, but really was enlightening uh, for us, was that when we talk about people, we uh, imagined the, the impact uh, that, that products have or, or cosmetics and personal care has on consumers in their lives. And that is absolutely fundamental. But we were absolutely fascinated by, by the stories of, of the people within the companies, whether they be, and not just the, the largest entities, but, but, but small and medium sized companies as well. Um, the, the ones that are coming up with brilliant, innovative new ideas that, that, that seem to, to benefit uh, people and, and, and the environment, and often through lived experiences. So actually, when you delve deeper into those stories about how that idea came to them and the journey they've had to go on, whether it be the, the risk and the investment of time, possibly money and everything else to try and get those 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 stories through. I think that is for us, that was really fascinating. And again, I, I, I've, we felt that the relationships we built with, with a lot of the, the, the companies, I mean, we would encourage them to be be proud of those stories and be confident in 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 telling those. I, th I think that could really build trust. So very briefly mindful of time. Uh, the thing that, now I think we've lost John. Uh, um, the, the thing that I was just gonna add is, um, I think it's really important and it's, in, it's, it's to take these stories and unpack them a little bit more. So I, I could not agree with you more, Simon, that you know there is absolutely some work to be done to look at employees from a people perspective, look at the various different dynam dimensions from a planet perspective and then on products, maybe going deeper to look at some of the challenging aspects of the product pipeline that some of us may or may not be uh, happy or enthused about. The other part I was gonna say is that I would have the question, how do you turn this into a broader mm -hmm. communications strategy and, and how do you now take this fantastic content uh, and now drive it across the many different audiences that you need to drive it again across? So less, how do you do more, but how do you actually get this content out in the right way in yeah. different variations to the various different people that you want to get it in front of. So that, that would be my two yeah. pennies worth. Yeah, well, and actually on, on that, that point, we, 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 do, we have a proprietary test called Science Engagement at, um, at BBC Storyworks, where, of course, in terms of the campaign, you, you want to measure the, the quantitative results, but actually by, by a, a, a system of facial coding, we can get people to watch the content and understand how their emotions have changed at different points in the film. And, and, and the idea is, is, because ultimately, yes, we can get lots and lots of people to watch this, but has there been a shift 
in comprehension has there been a shift in understanding and uh, and that's certainly something we'll be looking to do and and then from that revisit the people in those schools where have they got to revisit those projects that that were talked about how far have they come along uh, i think that'll be important okay gentlemen I, I hope you can hear me we had a slight little technical hitch there i've had to change my position we're coming to the end we covered you yeah, I'd like to uh, thank you for your participation. I'd like to thank Simon and all your team, and Nikki and Gemma and Vlada and Olivia. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all our partners and the associations for contributing to the makings of the films. I'd like to uh, thank Diana Boyer for all her support for putting this project together and this event together. And I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Magazard and Miyazek for her exceptional commitment over the last few weeks. The films are about to go uh, to be launched. Uh, there are films covering a huge range of topics within those themes, issues around, as I've said, biodiversity, water sourcing, uh, female entrepreneurship, uh, and so on, self-confidence, a real full range introduction to the diversity, vibrancy, and I think, as we said in this discussion, our ethical commitment as an industry, so I invite you to uh, go onto the website, enjoy the films, uh, give us feedback. And uh, I thank you finally to everybody who joined for your, for, for your participation in the event. Thank you very much.